I love that clip. That is from Captain America. If you haven't seen that, that's, that movie's worth watching. That's worth watching. Today we're going to talk about treating others with mercy. We don't know what's in somebody's heart. Uh, I do want to let you know something because people keep asking me, so I'm just going to tell you. So hopefully at some point next month, people have had the opportunity to get the vaccine. If they want it, we will be going uh, maskless at some point next month. We'll have Lord's Supper together. We'll be letting you know about that. I hope you're looking into the vaccines. If you haven't gotten it, I'd be glad to answer any questions. But even better, I'd be glad to refer you to my wife, who will answer any questions about the importance of getting vaccinated. I've, I'm, I'm double-shotted. Is that what you call it now? So anyway, and if I haven't had adverse reactions that are worse than normal, you won't. So anyway, I'm just saying. But, uh, but we're glad to see you this morning. So today we're going to talk about the idea of showing mercy. Here's the series verse from James chapter 2, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So let me ask you a question. It involved, by the way, this is my first potato illustration. I'm pretty sure in 30 years, I don't know that I've ever stood on the stage or the platform. What am I supposed to call this? This wood stuff with a potato. So this is a first. Very exciting. And here's why. So, you know, we have a tendency, and how do you tend to judge people? How do you evaluate people? Now, I don't want you to mix up discernment with judgment. A lot of Christians mix up those two, and so they think they just have to let people walk all over them. They have to hire a contractor even they don't like him. You know, somebody who rips them off. That's not what we're talking about. Judgment is basically not looking at somebody's works. You're looking at the outside. You're making a snap judgment based on what you see or what you perceive. Whether or not it's somebody's skin color, whether or not it's where they're from, by the way, as a country person. Anytime I've talked to my mom for a while, like I drive to church with her on Saturday nights, and I have been told, Eric, you realize Saturday nights you have more of a country accent than you have other nights. And I'm like, yeah, because on the way to church, I get, so honey, what do you think about what's going on in the world? And, and you know, what do you think about this? And how about next week? And you know, we really need to do this at the house. And then we need, and so I, you know, by the time I get to church, I'm like, hey, how y'all doing tonight? Good to see you. And when you have that accent, there are people who instantly think, he's dumb as a potato, right? He can't be, he, he can't be that smart, right? And, uh, and yet we, we tend to look at people from something we see. Maybe for you, it's northerners. You hear somebody with a New Jersey accent or somebody who says, pock the kai in the yard, and you think, oh, they're probably a jerk, you know? This speaker decided that it's going to talk to me this morning, just so you know. I know nobody can hear it but me, but there it is. So this week I was cooking potatoes. I love a good baked potato. If you're in a hurry, by the way, for a good baked potato, you microwave it for just a few minutes, and then you put it in the oven. I don't know if you've learned that trick, but my favorite is just to put it in the oven and let it go. Hour, hour 20, hour 30 sometimes, depends on the potato. Don't go two hours. That's not good. So I'm getting the potatoes ready. I roll them in olive oil. So I put them on the pan and I dribble a little olive oil on them and I roll them around in the olive oil. And then I get the sea salt in the shaker and I put some sea salt on them. Sometimes I sprinkle a little garlic on them. Man, I had some beautiful potatoes this week. They were big old potatoes and I laid them out on that tray and I was so excited and I Looked at one of them as I rolled it around. And I saw just a, just a little bitty crack. Just a, a little bitty crack. And I picked it up and I, it was the best looking potato. I mean, it was the biggest of... That was going to be my potato. You know, I pick my potato before it goes in the oven. I mean, some of you struggle with Girl Scout cookies. I struggle with anything potato related. I mean, some of you could eat a sleeve of Girl Scout cookies. I can eat a sleeve of Pringles. Okay, so we don't keep chips in the house, and if we do, they don't stay in the house because they get eaten. And so I picked up this potato, and I looked at it, and I just... Now, you can tell sometimes when they're soft. This one wasn't soft. It looked good. But when I bent the potato just a little, it was dark inside. The whole thing was moldy, disgusting. I was so upset. Because what I thought was a perfect potato was not. Why? Because I was judging from the outside. And when I saw the inside, I said, oh no. 
See, here's the truth for you and for me. God can see your heart, but we don't always see each other correctly. So James, in this book of the Bible that was most likely written very early on, maybe as early as 44 AD, not long after Jesus' death and resurrection, is reminding us, hey, be careful how you look at people. Be careful how you treat people based on what you see because you don't know their hearts. Anytime you feel superior to somebody, you're demonstrating that you are judging them. God wants us to love people and not judge them. And you can't love people while judging them. No matter what society tells you is the proper filter, we need God's filter. So we're going to look at James chapter 2 today. We're going to talk about keys to showing mercy to others. Number one, value people, not possessions. Value people, not possessions. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Time out. I just want to point something out here because if you read Wikipedia, they'll say, well, well, early Christians didn't really think Jesus was God. Well, there's a problem with that because this was written soon after that. And this word glorious Lord Jesus, it refers to the Old Testament, what we used to call Shekinah glory. It's a reference to Jesus as God. Just, Just a little Wikipedia Uh, uh, correction there for you. All right, let's continue. Must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. And this word for evil thoughts is the idea of having a divided mind. You know, you want to love God, but you also want to rape people. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich, listen, in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So you have to understand, in the early church, it was shocking to the culture that a rich person and a poor person would have supper together. That that they would call each other brothers and sisters, whether they were Greek or Jewish. Whether they were slave or free, they came together and the Christians felt pretty good about themselves. Hey, hey, we're, we're glad to meet with you know, poor people even though we're rich, but, uh, uh, but you need to sit over there. So James is like, you know, I know you're getting together. I know you're all having this meeting together, but you are favoring certain people. I know you're inviting them. I know you're not excluding them, but you're rating them based on what you see. It's the opposite of what God wants you to do. Never forget years ago when I was starting a church and we didn't have any income and didn't know what we were going to do. And I had a friend of mine come to me who had a small group that met in a home. And he came to me and he said, hey, Eric, um, I've got this group of about 20 older adults who want to join your church. I said, oh, well, that would be great. He said, but we want to come and we want to give money but we don't want to do anything. We don't want to set up chairs. We don't want to reach out to people. We're, and he really said all these things. And I looked at him and I said, well, then you don't want to come to our church. He said, what do you mean? I said, because we don't want a church where people just sit and soak. We want a church where people reach out to the community and love their neighbor and, and serve each other and go out of their way to minister to each other. We don't just want a church that sits and soaks. And he said, no, no, you don't understand Our church could pay your salary if nobody else joined. I said, no, no, no. God's going to take care of me, so why don't you guys go ahead and keep your small group? Which they did. See, the truth is, if we're not careful, the reason we treat certain people better than other people is because we want what they have. We want to go out of our way to, to get what they can give us. And if we're not careful, our thoughts are evil and we don't even know it. I'll never forget being at another church with some staff and three of my staff members came up to me and they said, Eric, did you see the car that so-and-so was driving? Uh, nope. They said they were driving, and I don't remember what car it was, but I remember thinking, I have no idea what that means. 
And they said, you know what that means? And I go, no. They said, it means they're loaded. And I thought, they're drunk? No. <laughs> loaded with money. And I'm like, so? Now, I gave them a hard time about that, by the way. But here's what I want you to know. One of the reasons why I have no idea what people give in our church, and I've had pastors call me and say, well, Eric, if you're going to love the people in your church, you need to know who's given the most. No. I, I want to have no idea what you give. I, I want to be able to look at you and treat you just as badly, regardless of what you give to our church. <laughs> Amen. Right, Dick? <laughs> Amen. And that's why I do that. Because I don't want you to ever think there's a second thought in my mind about you or what you do or who you are. It, it, because it's not about that. I want to treat you the same no matter what. And we need to be that way with other people. And by the way, let me tell you something about what people drive. Most people who are driving a fancy car can't pay for it. So, you just, so when I see somebody in a fancy car, you know what I think? Oh man, I wouldn't want that payment. That's all I can, that's all I can think of. Number two, choose love to fulfill the law. See, see, we tend to measure ourselves against other people. So we look at ourselves in the mirror, you know, and by the way, we can get so focused on ourselves. You know, the only reason we judge people is so we feel better about our potato, right? So we look at other people's and we're like, oh, that's one ugly potato over there, right? Uh, that potato is not as smart as me, right? Do you realize, by the way, we're all disabled compared to God? You, re you realize we're all special needs? Have you figured this out yet? I mean, God looks at us, I'm sure some days he's just like, oh, no, here it goes. Right? And yet we look at each other, and what does James do? He says, no, 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 don't keep looking at each other for evaluation. Look to the law. Look at what God wants. And here's what he says, James 2, 8 through 11. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Good job. But if you show favoritism, you sin. And they're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Why? For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point. By the way, anybody in here stumble at just one point? If you haven't yet today, just drive on 95 for a couple of minutes. Try to go the speed limit and see how long your sanity lasts. Okay? If, if you just one point is guilty of breaking all of it, why? For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you murder, you've become a lawbreaker. And we know that Jesus said if you thought it, you did it. Mm. So how you doing now? When you compare yourself to the law, how you doing? You know, we're like the old, with the old story about the guy who went to Africa and got sick. And so he went into town and on the main street in town, all the doctor's offices were in the same place down this one street in this huge city. And as he walked down the street, he looked at the doctor's office and he noticed, you know, this doctor had 50 balloons and this doctor had 100 balloons in front of his office. This guy had 200 balloons in his office. So he asked somebody on the street, what does that mean? He said, oh, every time somebody dies under their care, they have to put a balloon out. So this guy thought, well. Okay, so he found a guy had two balloons. So he went to that guy and he said, hey, hey, I need a prescription. Can you fill this out? Can you do this for me? This is what's going on. The doctor checked him out, wrote a prescription. And before he left, he looked at the guy. He goes, hey, you're doing really a great job. I noticed only two balloons. He goes, yeah, and I just started this morning. Let it sink in. It's better than Dave's joke. That's a low standard, by the way, low. It's on my bucket list. But here's the thing, we tend to judge like that. We look at what we see and we think we have a perspective, but we have no idea what God sees. And that's why the good news is that God knows your heart. And you know what the bad news is? God knows your heart. So you can come up to me and go, Pastor, I would just love to do this. When really you're thinking, I don't really want to, but I feel like I have to. You ever tell somebody you want to help them move? Nope, right? You ever pretend it was okay? Okay, I'll help you, right? Listen to this next verse. Let no demand, debt out, remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to their neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know what love cares about? Who you are. Love is grandchildren love. You, you ever watch grandparent with a grandchildren and you're looking at that grandchild and you're thinking, that grandchild is crazy. And the grandparent's like, they're the best thing I've ever seen. And you're like, yeah, they're wonderful. I just, I love them too, right? God wants us to see each other with grandparent love. You, you love who they are. You love their potential. You love what they can become. You understand that nobody's perfect. It doesn't mean you're not discerning. It doesn't mean you don't know that some people are grumpy and cranky and some people aren't good in business, but you still love them for who they are, not for where they come from, not for what they look like, not for what they offer you, but for who they are. So what do you do? Love goes out of their way for other people. So when's the last time you really thought about your neighbor? Maybe it's your neighbor in your neighborhood. Maybe it's your neighbor at work in the cubicle next to you. Maybe it's that person that you come in every day and they seem to have a negative word every single day that you come in. Maybe it's the person that's in your house. God, how can I show them love? If somebody's sick, you bring them soup. If somebody needs encouragement, you encourage them. By the way, I'm going to tell you one way you can grow a church. You want to hear it? Miss people. Did you hear me? Miss pe- Everybody wants to be missed. What if you didn't show up for church six weeks and nobody cared? Isn't it nice when somebody just says, hey, I've missed you? When's the last time you sent a note to somebody and said, hey, I missed you. I haven't seen you in a while. You doing okay? Oh, yeah, I've been going Saturday nights. Oh. Or, yeah, I hadn't come in a while. When we go out of our way to show people we care, what do we do? We're showing them God's love, not because of what they do for us, but because of who they are. Number three. Overcome judgment through mercy. So we value people, not possessions. We choose love to fulfill the law, and then we overcome judgment through mercy. I don't know if you've ever watched Undercover Boss. I love that show because it reminds me so much of working at a restaurant. See, I would go to church in a town that was pretty small up there in the big city of Titusville, right? I worked at Quincy's, and I'd go to church with people, and then I would wait on them. And they didn't know who I was. But I knew who they were. And there were people that I remember would stand in the front of church. Oh, Jesus, I love you. They were the rudest, meanest, most spiteful people to wait on. And I remember thinking, "Mm mm-hmm. Undercover boss, the head of a corporation, goes and works at his little, little company store. And he goes in there. And there's always some dufoso in there. That's in the Greek for doofus. Right? And he gets to see who's really doing the work and who's pretending. God knows that all the time. God knows that all the time about us. And so what do we need to do? If we're going to understand that we don't always have it together, then guess what? We have to have mercy for others too. That's what he says next. Listen, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Why? Because undercover boss is here all the time. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And listen to this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me give you a very simple phrase. You might have heard it from your mama. And it goes like this. But for the grace of God, go I. So when you're watching the news, and the news is going to tell you what's wrong with everybody, make you feel better about yourself. Well, at least I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. That's judgment. Mercy is... But for the grace of God, I'd be just like that. It's even on ESPN now. You watch ESPN, they try to make you feel better about yourself. This person in this billion-dollar contract who can throw a ball thousands of miles an hour did this. And you go, well, I would have never done that if I could throw the ball a thousand miles an hour. Judgment. But for the grace of God, I'd be in the same position. It doesn't mean that you encourage the sin. It doesn't mean that you say to them, I think that's great that you are an alcoholic now. Right? But what does it mean? It means, God, would you help me to be merciful to that person that needs your help? It's not justifying their sin. It's not encouraging their sin. It's not encouraging them to continue to do what's wrong. But it's understanding that if you were in that position, you might do the exact same thing. 
That's why Jesus in Matthew 18 tells the story of the unmerciful servant who was forgiven so much. How much have you and I been forgiven? 1 John says it this way, if we claim to be without sin, a whole lot of us, I I think if I asked anybody in here, have you ever sinned? (laughs) I don't think anybody in here go, nope. Nope. Most of us would be like this morning, right? On the way here, maybe, right? The thought I had, an action I had, a judgment I had, right? If any of us claim to be without sin, what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But listen to this. This is awesome. If we confess our sins, let God know. Listen, God doesn't need to know because He doesn't know. It's so that you can know. When we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He restores potatoes. When you're rotten inside, you know what's awesome about God? He fixes it. He takes all your broken pieces and puts you back together. That rotten part that's in you that sometimes you see and you realize what a bad thought life you have or what a bad habit you have or what a bad tendency you have and you see it and you maybe even say, well, my parents and grandparents even did that one. And when you see it, you say, God, purify that part of my life. God, I know that's not right. Let me tell you about mercy. When I was about to graduate from seminary, I was all ready, and I turned in my paper to graduate. I'd done all my papers. I'd gotten all my A's and B's. I got A's and B's in seminary, mostly A's. I was so proud of myself. I patted myself on the back so much I got tennis elbow. I turned in my paper, and it went to the registrar or whoever the guy was, provost, I think, and I got called into his office. And he said, Eric... Each of our classes is three credits, but you took a two-credit class when we changed, before we changed over, so you are one credit short of graduation. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you do a paper on this subject and turn it in, and I'll give you a credit. Yes, sir, whatever you need. Now, let me tell you how good God is. God sees that you come up wanting no matter what you do, and He looks at you and says, you accept my son as a free gift for your sin, and He pays it all, every credit. You can never earn your way to heaven. You can never do enough good stuff. That's the reason Jesus came and died for your sins and my sins. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, today you can say, Jesus, I need you. I can't earn my way to heaven. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm messed up, but I know you died and paid for all of that. I surrender my life to you knowing you died and rose again and I want to live my life for you. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. Maybe you're here today and the truth is as a Christian, you tend to kind of put your nose up at other people. You know, if they were like me. It's time for us to just be honest and say, God, but for the grace of God. God, would you help me to be loving and merciful? If Jesus could be merciful to his disciples, we can be merciful to other believers, other people who need him. Let's live that life and show other people the fragrance of Jesus in all that we do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for James, your brother who showed us what it was like to live a practical Christian life, not in judgment, but in mercy, because we need your mercy. And Lord, as James lifts up the law in front of us, we realize we can't do it. But that was the whole point. We need your grace. We need your mercy. So help us to give mercy to others. Help us to love others like you love us. We receive that mercy today, knowing that you love us not because of what we do, because of who we are as we surrender our hearts and lives to you. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.